right, so today is May 16, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. And today we have a uh, special, looks like it's a question posed by Gary. And if you saw the, uh, the post, um, he also made a response. And this is what we're, go it's, uh, what we're going to be discussing today. Um, do you want to start off, Gary? Um, well, any points um, you want to mention? Yeah, I'll, if I can just continue, just it's just a personal inquiry, and then we'll get on to the actual question. Uh, um, here, what I notice is with your your Reddit post and your prolific output of material that that. Um, I sort of struggle to keep up with it, um, and just recently I've stopped trying to um, spend all day on Reddit. Um, and I, it, regarding just what we're going to talk about with, with this meeting, what I'm noticing is when I, was, I stopped stuffing my brain with all the extra information, that that things like we're going to discuss now start coming out. In other words, I think it's just um, I'm just querying. I think for some people it's probably counterproductive to be taking in large quantities of information. That that, that I just feel that um, that it's inhibiting other things in in my process. Um, so I just wanted to say that for what for what it's worth. That, that I I think you know part of the reason why we've got this little thing to talk about tonight is that I stopped everything else for a little while and, and created a bit of space. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if you want to say something about that or... No, it's good. It's good. Just to, the, You see, what happens is a lot of the stuff builds up in the background. So uh, I, I think my connection's pretty slow. Can you Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I, I should I get on four G? Um, no, it's fine. You, you, it's okay here. Yeah. Yeah, right now. Oh, okay. It's okay. 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 Yeah. Okay, just just um, let me know if it's uh, if it's crappy, but yeah. So all of these things kind of go in drop by drop, and they all accumulate, and eventually you make connections, and so it's a good idea to just stop and just pause and just. Um, have a kind of a space to cogitate. Mm. A large part of this making progress in this is reflection and cogitation about just thinking about these things. Um, so yeah, I I put in a, a massive stream, but it's it's mainly it's not intended entirely for all of us. It's really for like a kind of general audience that I think that the lurkers. Mm. Out there. So it's it's mainly for for them. But yeah, you, oh, yeah. The, um, the, also, one of the things I'm doing is just creating a lot of fud and uh, a lot of noise with the deliberate intent that that it's it's obfuscation in plain sight. So oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's you know it, if you ever get this sophisticated and this becomes a real arg, th there must be too much material for the average Joe to navigate. And I mean, uh, you know, especially if you get assessed or somebody, you know, identifies us as a dangerous group. Or Too something. long didn't there, there mustn't be enough fodder yeah. for them. Yeah, yeah. basically the, the TLDR must look, yeah. say these are a crazy bunch of buggers. And there's a lot of protection in there. Um, can so, I make a suggestion? Yeah, to, just to, yeah. sorry, to interrupt, is that, that of course, uh, quite a lot of your posts are very relevant to the, to the to what we talk about here at the meetings, and you know, occasionally a particular one will be sort of essential to to understanding what the meeting's about. Um, I'm just wondering whether you could somehow just m maybe indicate posts that you particularly would like people coming to the meeting to read. I mean, it doesn't need to be; it could just be something that nobody else knows that you know assigned to, to us, you know, in in a, in a circle. 
so to speak. You know, yeah, read this. No, that's you know. a really good idea. That's a really yeah. good. What I'll do, what I'll do is I'll chuck in a little emoji. I'll find some some suitable. Yeah, emoji. just just yeah. that's right. And, and we can say, okay, well, we know we know we've got to read that. We can't skip that. And oh. if everything else is too much, you know, well, it's optional, I guess. You know. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try and do an all-seeing eye or something. <laughs> but yeah. um, I noticed yeah. that I'm I'm pushing a line, right? I'm definitely for you know laying down a trail, psychologically speaking. But I I notice <laughs> I'm quite disappointed in it that the the things that people upvote most. Uh, are kind of the exact opposite of the things that that I would like. Every now and again, I drop in yeah. something which I can just feel is a bit of a clangor. It goes down like a lead balloon, and it really disappoints me because a lot of those things are the track that that I want people to be on. Um, you know, it, it's just I guess they just too esoteric. Um, but why I'm disappointed is because. Because I'm laying down all the the keys, and uh, there's a lot of repetition. I'm getting a lot of you know up in and stuff like that. And then I intend to pick them up, and then you know, kind of where I say, like, take for instance a word like uh, egregore. Then I'm building up this concept from a lot of different angles, and then I drop drop it in with a, the plum thing, and then like. You get two upvotes. <laughs> I think I okay, got missed entirely. <laughs> but, um, so I, yeah, I yeah what you're up that. against is the fact that the the you know typically what's happening is that that anything to do with a, a good doom story gets plenty of upvotes because it's just easily digestible. You don't have to think about it. It's a bit of a excitement, you know, or you know the latest bit of crap, and uh, of course everybody will read that. But the other stuff requires mental work it, it requires work you know you, and i often going through your um list of things i'll rank them it, you know if i'm not in the mood for doing mental work i'll go and pick out all the pick the icing off the cake and store up a a, a pile of tabs for, for for the hard stuff until i'm feeling a bit better you know and sometimes you don't make it back um and you know it, it, um, i've noticed there a couple of times um, you put things up, and I thought, "Oh God, poor Hugh! He's going to be sitting there thinking that, that, that they've missed it again. They, they, this, I really wanted them to see this, and it's got like two upvotes." You know, um, I, I thought that was going to happen on that one you put up for it um, the. It, it doesn't you put really matter. Yeah. It, 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 it goes inside. So, so basically, I'll always come back to to something. Um, uh, and so you, you know, it goes round and round and round and round until eventually <laughs> people get it. But what what disappoints me is that I noticed that as time has gone on, it's just the environment and the stage we're at. But people have lost their curiosity. There's very, it's 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 kind of really disheartening that that people are um, they're not playful. They don't. They don't have fun, and they've lost their curiosity. And so, uh, I see it like with Jeff Hull and that stuff. I really, really uh, um, admire the stuff that, that Jeff Hull is doing, and I really hope we can get to contact him because he's doing exactly the same thing. He, he does it a lot better than I do. But, but um, it's a, it's exactly the same same thing, and he he reveals different layers as he goes, um, but. Yeah, he's doing uh, exactly my vision. But I realize now that when I saw that Institute video, it, it you know the impact it had on me was very profound. And I, you know, most most people <laughs> and people are I've told and stuff. It, it's I think they think it's kind of weird. Like, how did you get so much out of this junky movie? Um, but it's it's where it comes from. Is straight on a band band uh, that's that's really powerful, and it's powerful from the point of view of, of social change and enlightenment, and um, and and it's very very deep on on so many levels. So yeah, I uh, I can see that that Jeff Hull gets it completely, um, and yeah, I I would also like to 
I can see that people like um, Alison McDowell is also, she's got part of it, but she, but uh, there's a big blind spot um, where, you know, that <laughs> I feel that we could fill in quite, quite well for her. But she, a lot of this stuff is instinct. I think it's instinctive in Alison. But the part that I would say is the big black hole with Alison is that, that I see this thing that we're up against. Everybody sees it as a kind of titanic battle against kind of these Manichaean forces of good and evil. Even Kevin sees it that way. We just have different definitions of what this evil is. But I, so, so I sketch it out in things like the alien cortex and, you know, Kevin calls it the Jews, <laughs> but it's, it's much bigger than that. And it is, it's a cosmic principle. So the, it's, it's much bigger than, Alison can see the tip of the iceberg, but she doesn't see it. It's, it's really goes to the heart of the universe. And it's, it's kind of the debate that physicists have is, is the, is the universe fundamentally digital or analog? And the, it's it's neither, but that's the, that's the the battle. So everything you said about you know like uploading to silicon and stuff is that idea of uploading to silicon is a digital idea. It comes from digital rational thinking, and it's you know I just say well you can actually locate it in our alien cortex. Now a lot of people would say oh I'm just you know blaming six millimeters of the outer layer of our our, our brains, and say no. If, if you ran an evolutionary tape, I think the alien cortex would evolve. So if you ran an experiment on another planet, if you seeded it with life and ran it, then I think that the alien cortex would evolve. It's it's much bigger than than just the specifics that, that I'm talking about. And and so but where it gets really big and cosmic is it's literally the difference between life and death. That 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 digital thing is is a, you can call you can't get more you know too metaphysical or too hyperbolic about it because it is literally the devil it is literally death, and 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 by that I mean like Yahweh and the guy with <laughs> the you know white mark the the guy with the scythe it's time all of these things they they are one thing. And it, it is this idea that the universe is discrete and made up into these compartments. And that is our prevailing thing, basically. Or even, even Wheeler said it for a bit. He was saying, like, all the universe is information. And people like Leibniz said there's only two. The elementary difference in information is a one and a zero. It was Leibniz that figured that out. And our entire world and what we're doing now online is, is all ones and zeros. So that's that's about as, as basic as you can get for a discrete and digital world. And eventually guys like Feynman come along and he says, you know, the wave particle duality is just a misunderstanding that the ancients said. He says, it's particles. It's all particles. They misunderstood in the old days that they thought it was digital and continuous, but it's particles. We understand today that it's particles. That's what Feynman said. And so it basically it depends on on the observer and how you observe. So what Feynman said is not legitimate, that it's all particles. But that is the path that we're on. And we, you know, mainstream science says that it's all particles, it's all digital, it can be represented by ones and zeros. And because it's all ones and zeros, then you can upload to silicon. Complete madness. Yeah, but can I but, can I interrupt there? Do you mind? Yeah, yeah. Is is one thing I didn't put in that little uh thing I wrote was the, an extension uh, on the uh, the work that, that Charles Ledbetter and Annie Besant were doing. And I started to realise that a lot of the physical science that we do, which requires great expense and effort, um, you could see that they were demonstrating that they could do it by occult or psychic means. In other words, they didn't have to move from their drawing room. They could just sit there and, and, and see into it and understand it fairly well. Well, at that time they did it, they understood it decades ahead of any conventional physicist uh, in terms of the periodic table and that. And then I, I thought about these massive things that we do, the, 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 the uh, particle colliders, the, the, the massive constructions 
you know, enormous amounts of energy and effort and people and all the rest of it. And it struck me that that was probably exactly the kind of thing that that uh, Besant and Ledbetter would just sit down and tell you what those particles were going to do. Um, oh, yes. And it just goes it goes yeah. back to what I'm just thinking about what you said about Feynman and the particles, is that that uh, uh, the particle kind of implies uh, that everything's physical and material, and um, uh, it leaves out the possibility that we can deal with the mysteries of, of I don't know how to put it. The, the mysteries of, of how things are without having to be juggling matter all the time. Um, you know, we could just leave matter alone and look in, look, I guess it's kind of related to the kind of spiritual vacuum in the world we live in anyway. There's a spiritual vacuum and for, uh, for, for some people who, who are spiritually aware, they also have those psychic and occult the cities, which you were going to talk about later on, you know, and they would be they would be the scientists of of that less physical world, which would also be less destructive of the natural environment because it wouldn't have to disturb a lot of stuff. There's just so many things in the human enterprise that we could do without having to stuff around with with the natural environment and fucking it up, the, you know, ruining the bi biosphere and all this kind of thing. That, that we want, we, we feel as though we've got to do everything materially. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, I, so I, talking about this digital shit, I, my bandwidth is not, not high enough, so, so you're kind of breaking up. And, and that's not... Again, that's not coincidence. The fact that you're digitally breaking up now is exactly on point for what we're talking about and what, what I'm going to say next. But just let me get a broader bandwidth, and then I'll, I'll come out. So I'm, I'll, I'll just drop off for two seconds while I... All right. Digital versus analog. <laughs> he said it was neither, neither digital nor analog. So what is it? Oh, you're muted, Gary. He's... What were you saying? <laughs> oh, no, he said the ultimate it, reality it was, uh... has got no qualities. It's neither one or the other. Okay. It's, it's, ask him that question later on, see what he says. <laughs> yeah. You back here? Am I back? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah you're oh, back. Oh, sorry about that, but it's actually quite relevant with that little hiccup there. So the what our society and culture denies, and it's very important because it will lead to our extinction, is that the it's impossible to digitize information without information loss. So the universe. I don't believe that the universe is actually analog or digital. I think it's fractal. And so you, uh, I think that Einstein led us uh, up the garden path um, I, with the photoelectric effect. So I, so just a history on the particle thing and how, how we got to the Large Hadron Collider, just a brief history, was it started with uh, Max Planck and the ultraviolet catastrophe. So it was at the time when everybody thought of the world as fundamentally analog and uh you know waves so uh light and things they thought of as a wave and because of young's two split experiment so i'm sure you all know this stuff then then uh max planck explained 
the ultraviolet catastrophe. The ultraviolet catastrophe said that if you get a, an oven, so it, it was it was in Germany at the time when there were you know Germany was the premier industrial power and there was a lot of furnaces making glass and making metal and stuff like that. So they. If you have a big furnace and you make a little hole in it, then you can see some light coming out. Now, the way it works is that, you know, the only colors at room temperature because energy gets absorbed and some materials uh, let reflect some of the energy back. And then that's why we see it as a bit of a color spectrum. But that color spectrum doesn't last very long. If you start exciting the atoms to about 800 degrees Celsius, then they start to glow cherry red. So everything is by, is really a color based on temperature. It just gets a bit fuzzy at room temperature. But by 800 degrees, it's cherry red. Then it goes, you know, into yellow, to white, to blue. And they're saying like, okay, if you have a furnace that is like white hot, that's 2,000 degrees Celsius, then they, they'd say, you know, what's the energy doing inside that cavity? And they say, okay, it's a wave. So you know, how many waves can you fit inside the cavity? It's like a tuning box, exactly like a guitar. And they're saying basically almost like Pythagoras saying, you know, imagine all these strings strung across. There are only so many modes of waves that you can have. You can have, say, you know, say it's a one meter wide furnace box. Then you'd say you could have a one meter wave or you could have to, you know, a 50 centimeter wave because the, the two could fit in. But you, you have to have a fundamental mode because you couldn't have like half a wave, it would destroy itself. So when you go through it and you say, okay, well, then let's divide it up and see how the energy is distributed at all wavelengths. They got to the ultraviolet catastrophe. They said, them, you know, the shorter and shorter the wave gets, it runs off into infinity and you can say, well, this, the energy <laughs> you know, just goes up in frequency and uh, ridiculously. When they looked at it in actual fact and saw what the frequency looked like, it actually tailed off. It didn't go asymptotic to like like the uh, ultraviolet catastrophe predicted. So the only way uh, Max Max Planck found the answer to it, and he said, "Well, look, they weren't they're interested in really finding out what was happening inside the cavity. They just wanted to know how you could model it with numeric methods. In other words." digitally now people miss this point that the aim of max Planck was to give a digital explanation for an analog an analog theory and he found that by saying well let's pretend that these are not waves just say they're all little packets so just say energy comes in little packets and let's see how that goes so he ran it all and he said well if you have a fundamental packet that basically is called you know the Planck length and Planck constant now is is a uh, you're saying if you make say that energy is discrete and comes in little packets, it all works out. He never thought that the universe was like that. He just thought that's a clever trick so that you can approximate what's going on with black body radiation. Einstein came along and said with the photoelectric effect, he said photoelectric basically photo is, is solar panels. <laughs> Einstein, I think he essentially invented solar panels because no, maybe not. The, the photoelectric effect was known before Einstein. But, but what Einstein did was said, and he did this in experiments in his little laboratory. He got a little fo you know, solar cell, in other words, and put a lamp on it. If you double the intensity of, of the lamp, basically, if, if it is, um, uh, you know, waves, if you double that, you should get double the intensity of the output in electricity on, on the little plate on the solar panel. And he found that that isn't what happens. But what he found was if he used Max Planck's thing and said, well, light is actually quanta, basically what Newton called corpuscles, he's saying that if you say light is discrete, and light is everything, right? Light is information, light is matter, light is, it's, it's everything. So if you say that it actually only comes in little packets, in, in, in other words, it's digital, then it all works out. Now, Max Planck was horrified because he said, there's no way that the, the thing is like, the, the world is actually like that. But Einstein just said, you know, fuck it. Just, he say he said, call them photons and say that they come in packets. And, and so, you know, he took Max Planck's theoretical objects and said they're real. 
And that led to, uh, instantly, that buggered up Einstein quickly because it led to quantum theory and, and Heisenberg and all those guys saying quantum indeterminacy because, you know, that's the big problem about digital is when does one become two and two become three? It's very difficult. And so that's what they, they quickly found. And that's what's fucked us up ever since. It was Einstein that fucked us up. And then you get, you know, inheriting from this gargantuan debacle, you get people like Feynman, who's then, who then says it's all particles because it all works out particles. Why? Because you're using maths. You're measuring it with digital instruments. And you're using an, an, a digital brain, part of your brain to interpret it. So, of course, it comes out digital. And then eventually you get to the Large Hadron Collider, and it's just fucking horseshit. So by the time you get to the Higgs boson, you can see it's horseshit. Because what they're doing with the, the Higgs boson is, the, okay, first of all, in the Large Hadron Collider, they, they're not smashing atoms together. See, most people think you're smashing an atom together and then, you know, like throwing, you want to know how does this, you know, what's inside an iPhone. If you can't look inside an iPhone, then what you do is you just smash it against a wall and just see what bits that break out. And then you try and figure out how, an I, I, you know, an iPhone works internally by putting, that's how most people think the Hadron Collider is working. It's not. What they're doing is they're just getting, um, uh, hadrons, basically mass, uh, particles, and they, they're accelerating them, giving them lots and lots and lots of kinetic energy. When they collide, that kinetic energy is creates matter. So it's, you know, E equals mc squared is basically saying that when they collide, they're creating those particles. They're basically creating matter out of kinetic energy. And that's in, really important. So what you know, Higgs came along and said, "Well, we'll we'll find gravity of gra you know we know there's a gravitational field. Every field there's a particle. Particle, thanks Feynman." And so he said, "What would it look like if there was, you know, if you take the gravitational field, what would its particle look like if you go from you know standard model and how all the other particles work?" And he worked it all out. And then basically the Large Hadron Collider came to find the Higgs boson and it said, "Well, if we take that energy, that kinetic energy at that energy level." Then you say, how do we detect a boson and basically being created? Well, a boson is too short-lived to, to see in any, in any scale. So what they said, they could look at the decay particles and then say, well, according to Higgs, what Higgs worked out, that it would be two photons, two of Einstein's photons. So that's all they were looking for, the Higgs boson, is they said, if this energy... Now we look for thousands, millions and billions of collisions. We look on the detector for two photons coming out, just popping out. So, so we're talking millions and millions of particles, just a zoo of them, and they're just looking for two photons, just, just, just decaying. So, some particle that looks like on a camera that it's decayed to two photons. They find it, and they all go nuts and give out, you know, uh, Nobel Prizes and stuff. It's fucking crazy, fucking stupid. And the reason is because, uh, first of all, they didn't do any double-blind tests. They, you know, they 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 say all well, it had. They found it with statistical significance. But the truth is that you know, if I gave them a, a set of data, if if I gave all the teams with all their theories that munged all that data, and I just got you know random noise from atmospheric noise and whatever you know bits from fireworks and stuff. And I'm telling you, they would find the Higgs boson with significant, and nobody tested that. Nobody did it. Nobody, they're not using the scientific method in the Large Hadron Collider. They, it's not falsifiable. It's not, they, it's basically, they're going out uh, looking for exactly the, the things that, that, you know, back in the day when physicists were real physicists, they, you know, they call them, you know, um, woozles and heffalumps and stuff. And, uh, you know, quarks was from the nonsense poem because they didn't really think they existed. But by the time they get to the bos Higgs boson, then they're saying, well, if we can find that decay, that's it. We've justified all the billions we've spent. It's a big fraud. So, and I can prove to you it's a fraud because as soon as they found the Higgs boson and then handed out all the Nobel prizes, then immediately they say, hang on a minute. 
the Higgs boson, which is the particle that gives everything mass, wait for it, has mass itself. Well, where the fuck does that come from? Well, there's like the Higgs boson now has many Higgs bosons that give it mass. It's horseshit. That the Large Hadron Collider is a massive fraud. They don't give out the data. They don't actually publicize it. It's all done with public money. They all grant queens, and it's horseshit, horseshit, horseshit. So the the Higgs boson is just a chimera. It doesn't fucking exist. Basically, why? Because you can say it because the Higgs boson now has to have mass. Well, fucking give back your fucking Nobel prizes right fucking now. If the Higgs boson needs mass, you fucked up. And so what's the fuck up? The fuck up is that the world is not digital. The, the high energy physics and the particle world it does not actually exist like that. So, so you know, we abandoned the analog world and the, the wave nature and, and, and just pretended that it's all digital because of Einstein and being then computers. Now, the, uh, the thing about doing that is is not only do you get kind of cornered by these conundrums like the Higgs boson actually needs to have mass itself even though it's the particle that's supposed to give everything else mass but but um uh you lose that that kind of blavatsky kind of in insight in into matter and 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 the continuity of matter so so now the physicists are, have their heads stuck in a large hadron collider. The mathematicians went through all of this at the turn of the century. A very important part, in fact, what this, the pillars that our entire society is built on and the stuff that Alison McDowell is talking about, where this digital world comes in, the fourth industrial revolution, the transhumanism, this is all digital stuff. And, and uh, the mathematicians went through all this, and it was basically these guys like, Gil Cantor was a big name, Kurt Gödel, Turing, uh, all of these guys. And what uh, uh, Cantor uh, drove himself mad um, with the continuum hypothesis. In essence, what the mathematicians were doing was exactly what the physicists later are, are struggling with now. And that's that that uh, is to decide: is is maths continuous? So is it like a smooth number line? Or is it discrete? And so, so Cantor went backwards and forwards, saying he, he's proved conclusively that it, it, it was discrete, that there are actually digital numbers. The world is actually um, not a continuum. Then he, he, he proved conclusively the opposite. And he went backwards and forwards and drove himself mad. He was eventually committed to an insane asylum. I think the thing that we're really struggling to grasp it, it's neither so the, the essence of the material world is 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 really the wave particle duality it's it's a wave and a particle the the fact that we don't give credence to that anymore means that that physics has lost its way when we still accepted the wave particle duality most physicists today do not accept the wave particle duality because they've lost their way but when, by, by the time you get into string theory and stuff, you can see they've lost their way. By the time they start adding 11 dimensions to make it all work. So adding dimensions in, in, in uh, string theory, and they have to add dimensions now to get a model that works. And it doesn't work, by the way. But they keep on adding new dimensions. Well, every, you know, if, you, if you're a science geek and you, you're a science enthusiast, then you think, oh, other dimensions. Oh, these are, are realms that you know you could get portals through. Horseshit. Other dimensions are just you have an equation like E equals MC squared, and it doesn't fucking work with the real thing. So you just keep on adding terms. A, B, C, just add Greek letters. That's what dimensions are. It's just adding Greek letters to fucking equations. It's not another realm, and then you get Graham Green and these fuckwits saying, you know, well, it's folded up inside. That's how to imagine dimensions. Horseshit. Dimensions are just fucking a mathematical equation where you add symbols. So just, you can't get it to work out, so you just add mystery symbols. That's what they did. Ut utterly unimpressive. Give back all your fucking grant money and go and get a fucking job sweeping in the streets. It's a con game. They, they fucked us up. Now, this is not trivial because what they've done in is, and in the pursuit 
of and why they're doing this is the pursuit of certainty. You see, part of the reason why they insist the world is digital and why all these transhumanists are transforming the world now and why we will go fucking extinct on this path is, is because they think they're getting certainty, they're getting perfection, and uh, basically they, they're taking risk out of life. They're getting controllability of life. They're not. To get a digital representation of the world, what Einstein had to do and all Max Planck, all of these guys to make, make say that they're quantum packets, to get a digital description of the world, you have to lose some information. And they won't accept that. They basically say, well, you know, you can, I, with a computer model, in other words, I can make a virtual realm on a computer and I can model anything. No, you cannot. And basically, I'll tell you a reason physically why you can't do it. I'll just give you an anecdote, and then I'll tell you that, that Kurt Gödel and Alan Turing proved in the 1930s mathematically that you cannot. Our civilization ended with Gödel's paper. The whole project, the uh, Ernest Becker's immortality project, what we're trying to do with the cyberneticists, Norbert Wiener, and the Shannon, and all of these guys, that whole enterprise, the whole of our scientific industrial complex, and what we're trying to do, it was absolutely nullified by Gödel's paper. And everybody ignored it. Because, because it took away people's immortality project and their certainty. They wanted certainty. But Gödel said that there could not be that, that certainty in that way. It was either incomplete, any model, any digital description is either incomplete or inconsistent. And and so I I I tell you, um, yeah, I wanted to say some some anecdote of 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 that and say, um, but I I can't remember what the the example I wanted to give. Um, uh, I've lost it, but I I tell you, I've spent three decades in computing, and I absolutely fucking hate engineering and i absolutely hate working in the in the computer environment and the reason is i learned fairly early on that that kurt kurt Gödel was you know it's absolutely he did a proof by, by the, the way that that's cast iron but but working in computing has been laborious for me ever since <laughs> i understood Gödel's theorem because computers are absolutely a, a fucking waste of time so i've had to work for 30 years knowing that every fucking thing i've done on computers is a fucking waste of time and 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 not only that it's it's damaging it's damaging to the entire world and the, the reason is because you you can't what they want is bug free software and you can't write bug free software so i can make a trivial program that just says like hello world or something and you know basically you could say well that's consistent and complete and or you could make something that's closed but the thing the thing is that as soon as you start expanding the computer and make, make it take data in from the real world and put data out so but what they, what they teach you in very first day on Computers 101 is a computer is an input, a process, and an output. So you take information here, you munch that information based on rules, and you put information out. Now, what Kurt Gödel said was, you you the reason um, the reason why things are inconsistent and incomplete is basically because you can't get away from self-reference. Now, a lot of people have come up and said later. Well, you know, here's a model. You know, I'll give you a thousand papers where these idiots have come out and said, well, here's an example of something which was girdle complete uh, with, with, and it excludes self-reference. But you can't exclude self-reference. There's no way you can... Girdle's theorem uh, bites you in the ass because as soon as you take data in, do a process and have data out, the data you put out, you cannot tell whether that data will come back round and become input again. So that there's no theorem. And then Turing comes in and says, to actually tell whether you have no um, self-reference is the only way to do it is to execute the program. And you would never know. As the program exits, there are some programs that, that are, are simple and trivial. But, but 
this has been a huge burden for me because as a software developer, you, you are tasked with doing perfect software. Not today, and today they don't give a fuck. But for when I started in computing and through the 80s, there was tremendous pressure on us to, to do perfect software. They wanted Six Sigma software. Basically, they said, you know, Japan was the big bogeyman and Japan did Six Sigma manufacturing. And the, the example that they always gave us was that, uh, you know, if you are, if you ask for ball bearings from Japan and you say with a, with a like 0 0.009 defect rate, literally this happened. There's an anecdote that they, they'd ship you the ball bearings and a little packet on the side, and you say, "What's the little packet on the side? That's the 0 0.009 defect one that you wanted." So they would put the defects. <laughs> That's how fucking accurate they got with with precision manufacturing. So I said, well, if you can do that in manufacturing, why the fuck can't you do that in software? And you cannot tell an executive about Girdle's theorem. They're just too fucking thick to understand. In fact, our whole culture is too fucking thick to understand Girdle's theorem. And so, so the net effect is that we carry on. We get these characters like Elon Musk, who just fucking retards. And, the, the, and they will say, we're going to, you know, we're going to get this perfect. We're going to manage the world. We're going to do the industrial revolution. For, uh, you know, 4.0, and that we're going to get everything managed by AI. And they're thinking you're getting closer and closer to perfection. Bill Gates so, is a very, very bad programmer. If you've seen some of the shit he wrote, he wrote like this Donkey Kong program. He's a fucking awful programmer. He's just a thief. He's, he's one of these guys that kind of guys I've often had to work for. And basically, Bill Gates is just, just a, a lousy second, second rate computer program and he's a thief. He just gets engineers to work for him and steals his ideas. He stole kudos to get Windows. He, he uh, Windows itself came from Xerox and he stole them. So, so you know, basically he's a cunt. He's a low down, cheap little thief. And now he's made, made billions on it. But what these idiots are doing and what Bill Gates is doing, is saying, I'm going to make this perfect world where you know, the oranges are picked by machine and the weather is controlled by AI. You see, now what is happening with Gödel's theorem in that is it's building up entropy. Because you cannot, you have to represent the real world in digital form, you have information loss, right? You have to simplify things, right? You have to categorize things, you have to label things. You have to, for example, take the European Union. The European Union has decimated and brought great risk and exposed uh, humanity, at least in Europe, to, uh, a, to a lot of potential entropy and destruction by a simple thing. And that was just classifying the seeds that you could use in the EU. So we're talking about wheat seeds. They said, okay, they're, they're like 3,000 varietals. In fact, there's a continuum of, of varieties. So because they're doing everything digitally, they say, no, we can no longer have, you know, this little farmer has, has a field with, with a, a variety of corn. They say to, to have the EU in the common market, we'd have to classify all the, the corn that you, so you could market it and then regulate it. And so they cut, which was a continuum, but, you know, let's call it 3,000 different varietals. They cut it down to 300. Now, Geneticists knew that this was a big fucking mistake because you've put the whole system at risk of like a potato blight. For you know, Irish went all the way down to you know one, one foodstock or two maybe wheat and potato. When the potato, you, if you have a monoculture, it'll be wiped out by entropy, by disease. So, so what they've done in the EU by drastically taking three thousand varietals, putting them down to three hundred, is They've drastically, well, you can work it out. They, it's exponentially increased the chances that we lose all the wheat to, fu to some fungal or parasite, some, some kind of disease. In other words, just consider it entropy. Now, they did it because they wanted to be certain. They wanted to have Europe regulated, Europe safe, and basically have the common market work. But look what they've done. They eliminated all the, they, they exposed Europe's crop to risk because they lost the diversity. So basically in that monoculture, and it was just so that they could regulate it and make it manageable. So you see that they took diversity, 
in making simplicity, they've, they've uh, actually increased the risk that they were trying to avoid. Now, this is, is crucially important. There's, okay, now I'll go back to my experience, why it's been such a burden on me to work with fucking idiots like Bill Gates, because, because they, they're driving you to do perfect software. And they are too stupid to understand that you cannot do perfect software. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one pivotal moment in my life, and I got to, I get very emotional about this, but I got to be careful not to cry in the middle of it because it was so profound. But here, let me tell you this. So, when I was in my twenties, I worked for this big blue <laughs> company. And we, I worked on a bit of software that was the most prevalent software in the world at that time, in the 80s, right? So in the in the late 80s, and I was just a young guy. So, so but this software ran everything. This 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 did it was the most used bit of software in the world. If you if you rented a car, if you you know got on a plane, if you reserved a plane, it was all done on this software that was done in England. Now the the in those days the, because this bit of software management software it was done everything warehousing you name it logistics it it, it was considered at the time <clears throat> was it actually even launched rockets in NASA that it was considered at the time one of the most complex achievements um, in humanity. And it, it was represented about 4 million lines of code on mainframes. Now, that, that's, that's well superseded now. There's, it's, it's kind of quaint now. But, but it, it was quite something. So, so here's, here's what happened. So in those days, you, you would get on a plane or something like that. And, uh, you know, I, even when I went on planes, you'd see the <laughs> the, the, the you know, ticket, uh, the ticket counter, they would be tapping away. And I, <laughs> I could look over their shoulder and I could see shit that, you know, they had contributed to this bit of software. And those are interesting times. But what would happen is then then uh, that system would, if there was a bug in it, it would go down. And you would have like, you know, all the planes would be down <laughs> in America. It was very, very serious. And so there was relentless pressure on us. To make sure that there were no bugs and so yeah i was in you know it was probably about 400 programmers and stuff work on it and i was in one area was right in the guts of it where you really got into the, you couldn't avoid the, the hardware and the shit. you had to really know the hardware and basically the cpus and there was if something went wrong in the software it was tested to oblivion but if something went wrong, it would it would be something like you know you'd have to understand the instruction pipeline and the basically the two CPUs might be accessing memory at the same time and one would lock themselves out. You'd get exotic situations that you had to really know your stuff to to figure out. But if you got it wrong and they and they went out into the field, then they counted you know every day that that bug was out in the field, they counted it a hundred thousand dollars and would be you know that was a lot of money in that time. And then the, so, so anyway, this is the, the kind, you can imagine from this, the amount of pressure we were on to do perfect software. And, and so, uh, yeah, just, just, I'm a, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just, just insert something in here because it is kind of related to your question, Gary, but I, I, if I come back to it later, but, but so the, there was a guy who was about my age uh, called Mick. He was a very, very bright guy never went to college but uh to 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 give you an idea of the kind of environment i want to paint this picture very very vividly that, that uh the management so there was some problem or other that that's you know the guys looked at and i looked at it as, as one of the re reviewers and i said no there's potential for this to happen and the, and people looked at it and they said yeah, but Jesus, that's that's like a chance in a billion. It's like you know that 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 would be such a corner case. You know, we should let it release it. It's not going to happen. And Mick said, "Hang on a minute." In so front of all the executives, he said, "Okay, let's let's say what what do you say? Like you know, it's how 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 many 
you know, say it's a chance in a billion. You say, okay, now look at how fast the CPUs on the mainframe are churning. So basically, how many CPUs? Is that by how many customers? He said, if you release that, it'll happen once every 12 seconds. And they were like, whoa, <laughs> flawed. But so, so that's, you know, the, the kind of perfection that they were looking at. That's the picture I'm trying to paint. So here's the story. We got this series of bugs that basically fixed and then basically put up. Then one of the customers, like the FBI or <laughs> Hertz or one of these guys, then the thing would crash. Everybody would be down. There would be a huge panic. It would come back. It would have a look at, look at it and say, okay, yeah, we got it. It was this previous fix that we did. It's generated a new mode of failure and a new bug. Then we'd fix that, and then basically it would go. Out. And it went round, and it went round, I think, about seven times, which is rather a magic number. It went round about seven times. And we got in another bug, and we I mean, hang on a minute. This looks familiar. He said, like, oh, fuck. He said, like, this is the original bug that we saw seven fixes ago. And and I was just floored because we'd, we'd, in each fix, we'd push the problem on to a new thing and eventually come back full circle. And this is the part where I almost choke up. But... Um, uh, Mick was doing, oh, shit. It's, 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 it's hard to describe why I'm so emotional about this point, but you'll eventually get it. Mick was standing behind me and said exactly the same thing, had the same thought at the same time, and said, Girdle's there. And we both were fucking, I could have fainted. Because... That, that, see, <laughs> I don't recover this. See, the management wants perfect world where everything works out and there's no bug free. If there's a bug, you see, there's a tiny mistake in the software that means the planes are grounded. So look how entropy comes into the system. We have things that are, you know, tested and tested and tested to oblivion, these fixes, and reviewed and reviewed and reviewed so that no bug goes out. A bug will always go out because of girdles down. Now, it, because it's either inconsistent or incomplete, it means that those systems are going to crash in some circumstances. Then when they crash, the systems are there to make all the trains run on time and the planes run on time. So when that crashes, those those all those systems will be down. All the planes will be in the wrong place. There's a massive amount of entropy to get the system back into a known state. So, in other words, all the planes have to speed up, or you know, all you know, food spoils because all the logistics fails, and the plane's not there when food arrives. There's, there's masses of 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 catastrophe just ripples out from this one code bug. Right now, you've got to consider that entropy. All the food rotting and everything is entropy. So, so that tiny bug, that lack of perfection, it's kind of like a butterfly effect. A tiny grain of imperfection is kind of like a prion. Prions, I think, work this way. You get a misfolded protein or a bug in the code, and it, it basically it goes through the system and ripples out to create far more entropy. Now the management goes nuts. And says, we're going to fucking take heads. We're going to fire the lot of you. Because they're fucking C-level students that don't understand shit. They're basically Bill Gates's. So, the, so, so they, you can't, if I, if I sat down now to explain Gödel's theorem to them, they're too fucking arrogant, thick, and stupid. I've been told to, you know, I don't want to hear this shit. Get out. Fix that code. You make it work. You're in charge. Fuck off. I've been told in those terms. I've been trying to explain girdles. You cannot explain to these fucking idiots, morons, psychopaths. You cannot explain to these cunts that you that software is inherently buggy. You can't say that to them. They don't want to hear that. So that, so it, so they they just shout and threaten and bully. And so so basically, I've spent thirty years with this knowledge that you cannot get this perfect software. And what you're doing by pursuing it 
by putting the you know this perfect code in, you're going to get a bug that winds up in more entropy in the world. And and uh, and Gödel showed that you cannot get it out out of the system. So so this, I hope I'm not losing you or boring you to death in all of this. But think of it Can in I terms of Alice and McDowell, and in terms of the fourth industrial revolution and all of these things, everything to Eco Health mm -hmm. Alliance. All the programs they're doing, all the, the the all of these systems and the AI, the management systems. If you look at Alison McDowell's systems, the, they they're basically trying to regiment people. They're trying to regiment kids. They're doing, you know, um, impact tokens and stuff that they try and manage the poor. They, they, they poor people to to Bill Gates's are entropy, and they say, well, we kind of squeeze the entropy out, and we'll use software, and we'll use this kind of incentives and management, and so. I was all for a UBI because I, I naively imagined a few years back, I knew, naively imagined that it would allow people to escape from the system. But I eventually realized that we're not going to escape from the system because they're going to put caveats on it. They're not going to give you a UBI and say, go and write poetry, have fun. They're going to say, okay, here's your incentive thing. You can use this for this. You can use this to improve yourself here. But basically, they're turning you into a, into a slave, into a machine. Now, this is very, very bad from Gödel's point of view because what you'll get is these catch 22s and stuff you'll you'll have you riddle people into this world that's completely kafkaesque because eventually you you'll have well you can't you can't you're not allowed out you see imagine it. you're thinking linearly like a bill gates let's say bill gates or michael Shermer or basically klaus schwab he's saying like we're going to make a perfect world so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to basically make everybody have a cell phone because then, you know, basically that's one step. Well, later we'll we'll implant a chip in their brain. But let's let's start with a phone. And say, well, you have to have the phone. Why? Because you're a fucking terrorist if you don't. You we we can't have people break away people and stuff. So so basically you 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 have to have your cell phone. Then you'll wind up in these catch twenty twos where it's saying like, okay, um, I can't get a cell phone. Because to get a cell phone, you have to have an address. And basically, I'm homeless, so I don't have an address. So I can't get a cell phone. So then I can't apply for the UBI that would give me the, the rent to get the thing that gets me on the program with the, you know, things. You will have all these people. And then basically, those people be arrested on the street by a cop who says, why are you a vagrant on the street? Don't you know since Bill Gates is, you know, philanthropy program that everybody's no 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 hobo left behind so they're basically saying you know you, he, what you know what's wrong with you you haven't got a cell phone and you you try and explain to some fucking pig a cab on the street is like i haven't got a cell phone because i don't have an address and you can't sign up with an address and basically round and round the the circle so like this and he's going to say either you're fucking insane in which case they'll send you off for basically clockwork orange or otherwise, he's just going to arrest you, and then you, it's going to get even worse for you. And so, so basically, the more and more people will be caught up in this, and, and you, you can see the entropy growing as they're trying to get sane. They're trying to make the thing sane, rational, and make a system that's perfect. Everything runs on time. There are no more poor people. You have nothing, and you're happy. But of course, everybody would be desperately miserable. And so that, that's the, the world we're heading in. But it's not only the social thing that Alison McDowell under, understands. It, it literally will be the death of us. Because, you see, like us trying to fix bugs, if, if you try and manage one aspect of a complex system, you will be forced to manage more. So in other words, this is the danger of geoengineering. If you start down one path, you see, they... They're thinking linearly when they say, okay, we'll put microspherules on something. We'll put that on the Arctic. Very thin layer. It's a nerd substance, commercial. And it's probably not going to do anything wrong. And then they'll put it on the, uh, on, on the ice. They, okay, their, their studies already are digital. They're numerical methods. They use statistics to, to generate the impact and to, to decide the success of a pilot program. So in other words, they've simplified the data so it makes it publishable. Then they'll put it out on the ice. So, and then they'll find out because nature is more complex than you know the more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. And they'll find that these little beads wind up in the fish or the fucking, you know, some some 
you know, something in the ecosystem will take them as you can't, you know, everything is going to have an effect. Even if you put inert microspherial bits of glass. Uh, uh, actually, I'll just give you one example. Just, just a clear straight thing, straight shot to entropy is the stupid twat woman on the, on that, I posted that thing about them doing geoengineering and stuff in the in the Arctic and that conference. I put a comment that that one of the, those women answered, and I said, I said to them, you know, you know, for every they just selected that glass ship because it was a commercial product that's used in cosmetics and stuff. And I said, you know, for every ton of that shit you put out, you emit two tons of carbon. And she said, how do you know that? And I, well, I worked in the glass industry. So basically, the, ra the ratio is two or more. So, so basically, to actually get that reduction of it. And, and she didn't know that. So this was the woman leading the fucking project to put this shit in the Arctic. And then basically, she's, she, she didn't even research. She just said, oh, you buy these commercially, you sprinkle them on, look at the albedo. So, yeah, go back, girdle style, and look at the self-reference. You're trying to lower the albedo because of the, the carbon. You've just put two tons of carbon for every fucking ton of these things. You see, it's, it's the girdle loop again. So, so, so you can see what's going to happen, that this will be the death of us because she's, she's created, consider that CO2 is two tons of entropy. So in, to try and get an effect on the Arctic, which is minor, She's put just put two tons of entropy into the system. And this is how it goes on. These people need to be shot. I'm telling you. Basically, they, I mean, literally, they need to be shot. There's no question. Because, because they're too stupid to understand Gödel's theorem. And while they put these programs into place, they will be generating the risk and the entropy and the destabilization that that's, uh, that will, will destroy it. it it's, but it's, it's not an opinion of mine. It's a mathematical fact that Gödel said. So this is not this is not Hugh spinning, you know, wild theories. Is if you, I will show you mathematically, with an inviolate proof that this is what's going to happen. Okay, so that's that's my story. Sorry it was so long, but I can't tell you how, how important this is. It's the matter of life and death. Hugh. Um... Uh, it's just a simple thing, but um, when I've been very quiet sometimes at, and noticing if I pursue a certain line in life um, that I actually know is forcing circumstances to do something they wouldn't, they don't really want to do. You get a fixation. You want a certain result, so you keep forcing the circumstance to to do what you want to do, um, and you know it ends. It ends in catastrophe. It collapses at some point. But after uh, I noticed, um, after a while, because human beings just have got a bad habit of repeating their errors over and over, it takes them a long time to learn. Um, but I felt that that I could actually uh, feel that what I was doing by pursuing the wrong direction was actually I termed it literally as pushing up a, like a wave front of probability ahead of me that would precipitate um, the, the, the whole house of cards coming down. It was like as though I could see it as a as a as a uh, um, as a psychic phenomena, you know, it, it was almost a visual thing that I could think, oh, hang on, wow, look, if I just look ahead, I can see not the circumstances, not the physical things I was doing, I could see this impression, very much this impression of a, of a wave front. That, 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 and then the more you tried, the more you were, and the wave peaks would all come together until you had this, this uh, like a sonic boom, I suppose, you know, where you catch up with your own deeds. Uh, and and it, all, it all happens at once. But just in saying that, I'm thinking back to earlier because 
with this occult scientific investigations where they were doing something without having to do it materially. They were doing it by their, their kind of um, psychic powers or whatever you want to put it. Um, but th this is what's happening now where we've, where we've completely replaced um, uh, a sort of a cult is, is a misused word. I, I can't think of another word, but we've replaced an occult understanding of the way things work with a purely sort of scientific mechanistic thing, which which is just as you're saying, it's getting us into trouble because we're pursuing that to a ridiculous point. Um, but that seems that that loss of that occult perspective is. It seems to me to go hand in hand with the loss of a spiritual perspective in, in people. You know, I mean, a lot of people who are spiritually involved don't like that kind of talk. They think that being terribly spiritual or awakened or enlightened is some one thing and going off with the, uh, the Theosophical Society is another thing entirely, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, they're, 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 um, people once, I guess, once in some imaginary golden age, their spiritual awakening would have included their ability to see into things um, in, a, in a more of a psychic or occult way. And it wouldn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't go down this pathway of trying to manage the world to extinction you because you wouldn't see it that way. But we've lost, we've lost out completely. We've lost that whole sensibility. Yeah, but so, uh, so with everything you say, I could fill a library in response. But so, so the first thing to say about it is the spirituality. And so you don't want to get too attached to the kind of new age spirituality because what they, they're talking about is feelings. Now, you got, you're instantly on thin ice when you talk about feelings. So this whole digital representation in our heads of this bigger phenomena that's the discrete and numeric world, that's our alien cortex. Now, the feeling part are the other four layers. So a lot of people, when people start to start talking about spirituality, then they're often talking about the mammalian brain and kind of mammalian sympathies, which were, you know, to be left-brained and analytical, basically be reductionist about it, is, is the empathy for progeny and for nurturing young and things like that. So, so you've got to be careful about getting into sentimentality and also getting into dualism because it's the idea of you uploading yourself to silicon is an idea that, well, consciousness is just information and information is abstract. Both of those are absolutely wrong. Now, the converse error is to say it's all spiritual, it's feelings, and people get sentimental, and then they start talking about Carte Cartesian dualism. And they think we have a spook inside us. They say, no. <laughs> we, we have electricity, and there's more and more evidence going that they're quantum effects, and microtubules and stuff in your neur neural system. But... There's nothing like Cartesian Jr. It's, it's a mistake. It's as equally big as a mistake. So, so the theosophists in that are thinking quite dualistically. So, so uh, they did take up on Advaita Vedanta. So uh, Advaita Vedanta means Advaita. So Vaita means to. Ad means not to. So Advaita means non-dual. And so... They're saying that everything is one and inseparable. And I think that is correct. And so that, that is another reason why you can never make eliminate good or self-references. Everything in essence is coupled to everything else, possibly the quantum. It's like things are quantum, every particle in the US is is quantum entangled somewhere back to the Big Bang or something like that. There's something like that going on. So so but uh, the idea decays rapidly to nonsense where you get this idea a you've got this transhuman self that's information and can be uploaded to a computer and represented in, in digital form it's horseshit 
it's equally wrong to say that you have this essence, the spooky essence that gets sent on someone. Now, in the Western tradition, is that's the soul, you know, in the Abrahamic religions, horseshit. We don't have a soul. So the, the, either there's no individual soul, like a jiva or a jinn, right? So, so there, there is the soul, but it's the soul. The universe is basically call it light or energy or something like that. But it's 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 undifferenti it's undifferentiable and it's non-local. So you can't have this nonsense concept of a localized self that then basically when you die, you know, gets um, uh, transmutates into something else. It's it's nonsense. So the, the Buddhists try and do it. They say that you you have little bindu. They say, you know, like the you know, the Hindus do it as well. They say like, okay, you know, when the sages were coming up with this stuff, doing pretty much what Blavatsky was doing uh, in the forests and having people vote on, you know, whether they liked it and that kind of thing, that kind of science. The, the, some people quickly came up and said, okay, if you have a transmigratory soul, how does it move from the one body to the other? Because if you start to think about it, there's fucking a lot of problems going on here. I mean, what happens if, you know, you're on the fifth cell division inside the womb and it's like, hang on, have you seen the soul yet? Because it's like running really late. You know, the baby's busy. It just doesn't fucking work. So, so, yeah, so they said, well, some clever dick in the audience said to one of the sages who was you know jerking off a bit too high said okay mr clever dick if there's transmigration of souls which was just a trick you told to slaves to keep them in their place say don't worry you know you you're not in the upper crust today but wait for a few rebirths you can join us brahmins <laughs> it's just you know it's a slave narrative so so they're telling the slave letters one of the slaves got apathy and said okay how does this jiva get transferred from one body to the next so so the clever dick sage went um are there these little seeds called bindu and and it's done with those little seeds and everybody went, oh okay oh well okay that's all right then all right he said it <laughs> it's like i think somebody should have said okay clever dick show us one of these seeds like oh oh um oh, you want to see one of them oh shit now i'm stuck it's horseshit it's horseshit so so um can i can i jump in do you mind yeah, yeah. Yeah, where where are you you're saying um uh that that's that neither well we go back to you know that's neither digital nor analog it's not a wave or a particle but then you said well it's fractal and I guess does does fractal is fractal a kind of a parallel way of looking at universal soul? In other words, it's the underlying pattern of everything that just keeps unfolding and unfolding. Is that a fair enough thing to say? Yes, yes, it's, it's um, all right. If I can just follow on that that just what you said now about this smart ass question about well, how does this soul transmigrate from one birth to another kind of thing um but um in a way because what i was thinking was that there's actually time and space only exist for us they don't exist in i'm assuming that they're not going to exist in the fractal in this kind of ultimate universe um there's no trans even if this separate soul did exist it wouldn't need to transmigrate because everything is all in the one place it doesn't actually need yeah. to go anywhere you know, that's so I mean, it's a bit of it's that kind of soul of an, is legit, but that's the Atman, right? Mm, that's not the G. I'm, I'm not positing, yeah, I'm not trying to posit that there is or isn't. I'm just saying that, that like, there would have been a much simpler answer than positing the little little particle of, yeah, you know, like, because like, I mean, it, it, there's people, not, yeah, Jivan Mukti and and these the. So later guys, um, like the Shankaracharya, the one that, that's, that's commented in the Gita and that, mm -hmm. the, those non-dual Vedantists, um, um, guys like Vivekananda and uh, Sri Ramakrishnan, those guys came up with that, that more, more like yeah, yeah. that kind of answer is like, it's, it's, all, it's all one. one it, it's so all, because you, when you look at it, I think, 
Well, the obvious thing is time, but I think time is just a concession to the fact that we've got a, a brain or processing ability that, that that's fairly linear. It, it can't handle multiple things going on at the same time. So in order to make it work, you have to the time has to exist as part of that. I, I, you know, I would uh, just, but, but, I would but just listen, listen to what, what you say. The, yeah. the time has to exist as part of that. So basically, time mm. is subject to being a particle. So, so it ha it has to be partial. So it's digital because it's partial. So the fraud in the digital mm. world is to say that mm. it admits to parts, and it's right. it's apparently a res a, a admits to parts because I can I can see two clouds in the sky, for example. I can say there's one and there's another one, but it's like, well, hang on a minute. Where where does one cloud leave off and then the next one start? It's it's kind of just a, a made up story that I'm just saying that the two clouds that I'm looking at in the sky. It's a, to you know if you look at it, say say what's a cloud? Well, it's just uh, vapor molecules or vapor particles and stuff. And you say, well, they're, they're, it's all vapor particles. There's, a, there's one a dense dense cluster here, and there's a dense cluster here, and I say they're two clusters, but nature says, well, <laughs> fuck, I'm, I don't see it. I, I can show you that basically it's just a continuum of, part, of particles in, uh, in water vapor. So, is it, so think of it this way. If I get a Petri dish, and I say to some, somebody like Michael Sherman, I say, okay, here, the, how many sections are there in this Petri dish? You have a fluid in it, so like a part of it, like Moses up the middle, and then Michael Shermer says, well, there's definitely two. So I say, okay, let's go back and say, when I transitioned from one to two, tell me exactly where it was. A part that, you know, Moses-like, I put a big furrow between the two halves of the Petri dish. There's liquid on this side, liquid on this side, and I'm just getting to the last bit. So when does it become two? Yeah. Basically, when's the last particle that you say, oh, no, definitely it's not two? But yeah. you, you can't find that. You'll be defeated by Heisenberg and all, all this kind of thing. There's, so so, so there, there isn't a definitive place where one becomes two. So it's fuzzy. You can't, you can't get the digital world. To, I'll give you another example of why, how you can't take the digital world. So the digital world, implies that you can have a wave and you can do, say, Fourier analysis and make a square wave. You can't. You can do a Fourier transformation, an infinite Fourier transformation, but you can never square those fucking corners. They'll always basically have to go. So you, you, you know what Fourier oh, analysis is. Yeah. You decompose a signal. Mm -hmm. So all of this is, if it's information, it's a signal. Right? Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is, you can always get a particle. You, you can always get a digital signal. So they say I can get as much fidelity as you want in analog or digital, whatever you want in, in visual or audio. They say yeah. no, you fucking can't, because basically yeah. it's saying if you you would use Fourier analysis and say you know okay I can use these um, sign forms and you know what Fourier analysis is you can or you can make any pattern by adding fundamental sign forms, right? You can resolve everything down to its mm. fundamental waves and add them together to make any wave, right? That's amazing result that Fourier came up with. And so Fourier analysis, you can decompose everything. So, so I can give you sine waves as much as you like, but you cannot create a square wave. Mm. So a square wave means that there are are absolute transitions between troughs and peaks, and they square. But to be a, a square like that, that sharp corner means that you have to have an instant transition in time. Now, mm. there is no such instant trans transition in time. You can actually go and even Einstein's theorems can show you that that it's got to be smooth. You can't. You cannot say, okay, if I if I give you a particle in the universe and I say. It, even if you take Newtonian F equals ma, and you say, okay, this particle is going to move, but I'm going to I'm going to start and stop discreetly. I'm not going to have any run-up. It's 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 basically in an inertial frame, st stopped relative to this particle, 
Now it's moving relative to this part and it's stopped relative. You can't get the stop and start to, to not have a ramp up. The universe does not permit it. And it's showed in the Fourier analysis that you cannot get any waveforms that will actually square out that that way. Yeah, no, so there's no like instantaneous we transition. That, realize that, yeah. and and that's very very important. Is that the the digital world is an approximation, and it's losing information, and that's what they refuse to to believe. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's, it's just it's another thing. Getting this, by the way. <laughs> Um, I'm trying my no, best to explain that, but is yeah, everybody? I, I mean, you? you're, you're just saying that you you can't have an instantaneous transition. It, it, it's not possible. You well, well, well but you say break. one and two. You have to have an instant mm. to to say when one becomes two. Yeah, you have to to assume that that's the case. But I was what you were reminding me of too was in the picture of. Um, I think possibly as an extension of that, we assume that phenomena are separate and not connected. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, that is a mistake because, well, for instance, if we go back to that particular little insight that Ledbetter and Besson were having with the hydrogen atoms, um, it, it, at first, if you've not, not encountered that before, it sounds as though they're accomplishing something miraculous. But that's because we're probably assuming that there's no connection between these people and the hydrogen atoms. It's, 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 you've got, mm -hmm. it's like a scientific thing where you've got a hydrogen atom there and you've got a scientist and his equipment here. Well, you haven't. They're not separate from each other. They're part yeah. of the whole same thing. And in, in a sense, I guess, what they'd better invest in were doing was they're just looking into an, a, an extended part of themselves. So yeah. it's actually yeah. quite reasonable if you look at it that way. Yeah, you see, um, the way I understand it is if it's a fractal universe, then basically it's scale free. You can't tell it what scale it is. So that's a very important result because a lot of what science has done is assumed that you have to have better telescopes and better microscopes and better atom smashes. And basically they're thinking you have to have better resolution. To, it's, it's a very linear idea to say to examine the atom, you need to have more and more higher energy physics. But if it's a fractal universe, it's scale free. So I could do pop. I can study population dynamics and find out more about the arseholes in spending twenty billion in the Large Hadron Collider. You see, in the old days when they did better science, basically people knew that. But at the time of Newton, Newton studied alchemy, and now they don't think that's legit. But you see, you a physicist wouldn't give you credence for basically being able to do say you know, population dynamics or something like that and say that it gives you the in, insight into an atom. But of course it does. It's, it's, I can show you results in, say, uh, AI and unsupervised and supervised learning machines that, that you know, like k-nearest neighbor stuff. And you know, it's very often that you do k-nearest neighbor analysis and, you know, a physicist would walk up behind you. I, I actually worked with a, a physicist uh, ex-physicist on on a recommendation and, and all the time I, I would draw stuff up on the board and he would be stunned because he'd say but that comes out of particle physics and so then I'd get him to tell me the thing that he worked on and it was like the stable stable relations of a sodium atom so I said basically well okay take a sodium atom as a recommendation out of the recommendation and you can see where the stable configurations are uh, for that recommendation and then it, it's solid it would be a good recommendation we're talking about song recommendations so it's like how can you get a spot correspondence between song recommendations and a sodium atom the stable configurations of a sodium atom it's because it's fractal all these principles are repeating in different ways so you can't so so you don't have to have a good microscope and a good telescope in fact it means you're adult it, it is a better scientist could do it you see there was a time when galileo and stuff they say oh we made this big breakthrough with the telescope and say there were people that said no you 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 dumbasses <laughs> you, you you can do this without a telescope now the michael Shermers and that look back and they said those guys were so stupid they even rubbished the telescope and look what the telescope the telescope dumbed us down an awful lot 
but they don't see it. Oh, look at the discoveries that Galileo made, and then we got to understand the heliocentric universe and stuff like that. And it's yeah, like, oh, there's, it's, it's another thing. There's another thing that, that I'm just thinking while you were saying that is that um, the, the telescope was a – it could be seen as a yearning for a kind of literal literal uh, explanation for things, whereas up to that point we have been happy with the, the, the stories, the legends and, and fables and, and the, the – uh, the, the I don't know how to describe it the the, the, the kind of um, uh, explanations of how things are which I think that's what we were talking about last week um, is and how they were perfectly satisfying but then at some point we wanted this this we wanted to take everything from being figurative and make it literal instead. Um, and, and so the, the, the scientific instruments all became this process of taking, uh, more or less taking the fun out of the story and turning it into this dry catalogue of of, um, uh, of fa connected facts that we discovered. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, but not entirely. You see, the telescope had some value in, in the fact that it added some randomness and it added it added noise right so so for, uh, for example a lot of the opposition that galileo got was everybody had a perfect universe they had the harmony of the spheres and they thought all these you know god made these planets so he must have made them perfect and they must be like mathematical objects the moon must be super smooth and stuff and then galileo looks at it and says no it's rough the moon has craters in and stuff and they didn't like that but you see, in saying that and saying it, it basically it moved on that stale digital and reductionist. You know, they they reduced it. Aristotle had done a big snow job of reductionism and um, and rationality, and reduced the universe to this dry, stale perfection. So so Galileo then did act, the telescope act like a shamanic instrument. So. I'll tell you something really interesting. In shamanic times, this this was all done. It's rather strange because sh shamanism was a universal religion. Uh, and the reason they know that is because anthropologists study populations all over the world, and they have similar, very similar elements. So sh shamanism and the mother goddess look like two uh, universal things. Here's an amazing thing about shamanism. All over the world is this bizarre little quirk that shamans, Sophie will have to tell me here, but they have they took the bone, the sternum, this is the sternum, right? They took the sternum bone. This is a universal practice. It's completely bizarre. All shamans around the world had a practice, you can find this practice, where they take the sternum of some animal, human or deer or whatever, and they use it for divining, you know, fortune telling and uh, scribing, you know, that kind of thing. And you say, like, why? What, what's the thing about a sternum? It's the, it's the most arbitrary piece of shit you could possibly think of. Uh, the, the key is that a sternum is flat. And, wh and what's universal about a sternum, and Sophie has to correct me here if I'm talking bullshit, but... but What's amazing about a sternum is it crazes, it, it cracks in a random little form. And that's why they all used it. Are you there? No, yeah, I'm there. I was just wondering what you want. Uh, so I'm feeling, I'm not feeling, I'm feeling a bit under the weather this evening, so I'm not oh. anticipating much. I, I think I'm a bit tired. But uh, so yeah, you were, you were I, I was listening to you talk about the anatomy oh. of the sternum and it's fascinating. Well, 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 the the thing is, if you get a sternum bone from an animal, yeah. why use that for for fortune telling? But the reason is that it it cracks and it mm. gets a it crazing pattern. So that crazing pa pattern is a random pattern. It's like a Ross block ink block test, a Ross ink block test, right? So so they all using it. Basically, yeah. you're using it as a random field, just like a Jackson Pollock painting or, or something like that. So, so what they can see is their own 
neurology because there's no information in the actual crazed um, pattern. The human brain is, like Michael Sherman lo loves to say, is, is a pattern recognition machine. And when it can't find those patterns, then you get the kind of apophenia where it, it starts to make the patterns. And that's the divination because in that apophenia is exactly what Gary came in on on this whole conversation is you feel these things building up and they kind of burst on you. Well, well, if you if you do that kind of scribing and uh, um, uh, what's the other words? Uh, crystal ball gazing. I can't remember what you call that. But anyway, that that gazing on on a random thing it brings out the, in almost like a emergent dream sequence that it it'll bring out that you know apophenia and those relationships. So so telescope I think did something similar to to that, and it. Uh, you know, it said that the, by looking at the moon and saying things are rough and it's disordered and murky like that, it it then spurred science on to look at the world uh, deeper. So, so Aristotle didn't do the world a, a, good, a good service because he made a very dry, stale world that is the world we'll get to with a transhuman world. In other words, he, he got to an early transhuman world where he said it's all music of the spheres and these ultra smooth billiard balls and all this perfection and and they said you know the, there's there's only imperfection down here on earth and it's only apparent it's all really billiard balls down here and it's all teleology and if we could you know laplacian like understand every trajectory of every particle we could know the future with perfection it's a very dry stale dead world in the world of the fourth industrial revolution but it's it's not true. It basically, the the it's it's a w low, widely low theory now. Thank, thankfully for quantum theory and that saying that there is quantum indeterminism, and the world is is indeterministic. What it's a mistake to go from there to say well it's indeterministic then it's random. No, that's what Gould and those guys said. It's like evolution could turn into anything. We don't know. You know if you. If you got the conditions of life on Earth, put them on Mars, and we don't know, there could be three-headed beasts and with the you know head up their ass. We don't know what would evolve. Yes, we do, because basically these patterns are the only so many elements on the on the periodic table. All these things are working in filter feedback mechanisms, and so yeah, you can say with some certainty. If you this this vague hints of the proof in this. If you look at the Cambrian explosion, the the they're all this weird cornucopia of these experiments that were just an explosion of possibilities of animals. But they soon got down to what, you know, was a very narrow pattern, very few patterns that, that actually survive now. And you have to assume that those are universal patterns. Okay, if you're not completely too bored at this stage, then I'll chuck in one of the things that I'll, I ask you to remind me to reference, and, and that's the Phoebe and the, and the feather. So, so now to go back to this, this hopefully will explain what Blavatsky and the Theosophists and and that that kind of metaphysical science is what they're doing is they're finding archetypes and patterns, and and reapplying them is what Newton was doing. New, Newton got the idea, not for gravity, not from an apple falling. He got it from uh, as above, so below. It was an old alchemical um, dicta. So so he took that and he said, well, whatever force keeps the moon up must be the same shit as an apple falling, which was no a connection nobody made. But he made it because of, of alchemy and it, not because of scientific observation or an apple. He, the apple was a joke uh, and, and actually <laughs> a very deep insider joke, by the way. <laughs> that apple joke is 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 a is a joke for the cognoscenti, which I'll I'll explain to you later one day if you like. Okay, so now, how this this works in terms of discovering universes? I'll give you this example, and you, you can either take it or leave it. And say like, oh no, Hugh's gone completely off the reservation. This is bullshit. That that will be acceptable. Uh, as a thing, but let, I'll tell you, this is my kind of explanation. So we are Phoebe's our dog, our family dog, right? 
so Phoebe, uh, um, just absolutely gorgeous thing. It's basically a Springer Spaniel. If you ever had a Springer Spaniel, you'll know that the, the dogs, abs they be bred, they're hunting dogs, and they're bird dogs. They're absolutely nuts about birds, just anything about birds. And you, you, you can't keep them on a leash. They just go and beat the bush, just, you know, up in the northwest, Phoebe would come back just in ribbons because there's so many thorns and brambles and stuff, and just absolutely just overjoyed. You could just see the blissful joy on the dog's face, just ch you know, getting cut to ribbons by chasing these birds. And so, so okay, so you got the picture now. Springer Spaniels absolutely nuts about anything about birds you just say bird phoebe and then, the dog will go nuts and basically sees a bird here's a bird okay so now here's the thing we had this puppy from the day it was born so i i've been with the dog all, all the the time since born i know exactly what it's seen and it hasn't seen and how nuts it is about birds one day i found a feather and i said to and I basically, I put it on the floor in, in front of Phoebe just to see what she'd do. She went nuts. She instantly knew that it was something to do with a bird. Okay. Now, my family said, like, what are you so impressed about? It's like the dog's nuts about everything about birds. Here's the thing. How did the dog know about a feather? It never seen a feather in its life before. So these guys have, you know, obviously trained the, the dog so that it's basically genetically predisposed to, to hunt birds. So, it's, so, so they've, they've trained a dog through many generations, Springer Spaniels, was trained to be nuts about birds. But what is the chance that they trained accidentally the dog to recognize a feather? How did the dog know? that a feather was related to a bird. So that it, it now understand that the dog only just saw the shape, right? It possibly knew the, could get the smell. So it could, could maybe say they inadvertently, but you can see that there's an artifact that, that in training the dog to be nuts about birds, and then basically this is a bird in flight that it's really trained for. Somehow they, they also trained part of the dog's brain to recognize a feather, but they never explicitly trained that. That's just an artifact, a side issue. So imagine this possibility. Maybe, just maybe, that the, the dog is nuts about a feather because a feather is an intrinsic and emergent property of the bird phenomenon. In other words, if I went to another planet and seeded it like Gould says, yeah, you, would, you couldn't predict what would happen. I'd say, no, I, I bet you you could. I bet you you would have flying things, some things that kind of got the idea about flying. You'd have a few mammals and flying squirrels, but you would have a few reptile kind of things that flew. And when they did, they would rediscover f feathers because feather is, a, is an archetype. It's more like a principle of flight. And so, so I'm, I, I'm sure in my own mind, that you would you could seed an experimental life on another planet and you would find a feather now where does the feather come from it's part and parcel of a whole nexus a language a pattern that we don't have that represents bird so it's it's like a platonic form it's like the Aristot aristotelian category it's saying there is such a category as bird and if you get that category right there will be this fallout, a feather, this other category feather. Now, they accidentally, by training the dog to recognize the bird category, they also inadvertently got it to recognize the feather category. Why? Because there's some mathematics, in, in, there's some, some grammar in the universe that, that uh, makes, makes these universal categories and so that's another explanation for you, Gary, for what Blavatsky and them are doing, is they're taking, they're, they're describing these universes. So now think of Phoebe in the dog's brain. The, Phoebe's got, got something that says bird. It's all about bird. That's welded in. Also got a bit about feather. Now, if Phoebe could do Madame Blavatsky, 
Phoebe could go and like, uh, I'm going to try and distill the essence of bird from my own brain. Because my own brain evolved in this world of these categories. And then basically in this kind of cogitation and reflection, I could say, I have this concept of feather. You say, it must be associated with a bird. I've never seen a bird. You could do experiments on this. You, you could get like a Helen Keller and you could say, if, if you could introduce Helen Keller to one thing, like a bird and say, okay, give you a feather and say, which category is associated with cars, planes, everything she's only seen once. And she'd say, I think for some reason, I don't know why, but something tells me it's related to, to this bird. And so, so yeah, yeah you, you've got this, it's like as though, um, the, the feather in the bird and the feather imply each other that, that you know, yeah, but not for you any, take... you see, but Shermer would say it was apophenia. But Michael, you see, if Michael Sherman knows that a bird and a feather are related because he was a good kid in school and he, he basically he did his homework. But, but if, if Michael Sherman had never seen a bird or a feather and, they, and, and you, you showed him and said, these are actually related, you'd say, no, they're not. What, what's related? I can't see any shape, color, nothing. There's nothing related. It's apophenia. Say, no, Michael Sherman, you're a twat. They're intimately related. In fact, you can't have a feather without a bird, and you can't have a bird without a feather. We, we don't know the grammar that the bio, biology is doing. But we don't understand the DNA and what, what's permissible and what no. isn't. But I but think you can see that, that in, in you can see that in simple ways. I, I can't think of an example, but in, in situations where people have um, maybe had some necessity and they had to build a tool or something to do a job, you know, and completely un, completely disconnected from each other, but they would both end up with something like the same result. You know that that there will be something about the entire problem. Would, would more or less define what you ended up with. Like the bird ended up with the feather, I guess you, if you want to put it in that direction. Um, and, uh, and, and also too, possibly, um, uh, oh, sorry, I've, I've forgotten it. But I, I mean, you know, this, this whole thing of coming up with solutions to problems, people who come up with the same solution completely independently. Um, yes, it, yes. as though there was something about the nature of the situation that necessitated that 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 result. You know, it wasn't just coincidence, or you, you know, um, yeah, it, uh, it's, the it's, bird it's in a way. A bird is. Come. Yeah. Sorry. It's it's like a an idea's time has come, and then many people. There, there yeah, are a lot of too, things yeah, that, yeah. Were, that that are competed for, like Leibniz and and Newton competing for uh, for the calculus. But the, the idea mm. of the calculus is hanging in the wings. There are a lot of contenders for, for Einstein's uh, theories. The jet engine, Heinkel and, and uh, Whittle mm. independently came up with the jet the, engine. The, the, the jet, and yeah. The, yeah. The, I, the reason for that, I'll tell you tell you this little aeronautical secret that for some reason te uh, technical historians don't know this, but any pilot will tell you that Technical historians often cite the jet engine as something that came out of the blue, as, as like complete thing from left field with no rhyme or reason. It's not true. A, a pilot, pilots know, and historians don't, that they were supercharging in, engines, uh, yeah. aero engines. And so it they had big yeah. superchargers. And so yeah. they had the turbine. And then somebody thought, well, how do we drive the supercharger? They said, well, why not just make it a, a ducted fan on the on the on the exhaust? We put a shaft, and with a few belts, we can drive the uh, compressor. So you had the compressor, and you had the thing, you know. Then the complicated engine, and then you had the exhaust drive, which was the drive motor for the compressor. And, and so you can see, you're just one step away from somebody going, "What the fuck's the engine hey. for?" You got a yeah, huge compressor. You got yeah. the exhaust yeah. fan. Why, why don't you just cut out the engine? Just say this huge monstrous thing. Just say it's just say it's a big heat sink. Just put, so, so you can see that basically. So so it, so so you can see that 
the the guys that worked with engines have this thing yeah. just hanging over them. This question is, what's the engine doing anymore? What, what's what, it doing? What, yeah. But you That's see, just the uh, benzene molecule. The benzene molecule was was invented by I um, can't remember who it was, but he basically did he, it in a he, dream. And then many things like it. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, that's also reason. there's what you're saying is uh, there's terms they use like you know. Um, a, a quickening, you know, that there's a sort of a gathering of, of focus of, of what, I don't know, you know, you could go into details about that, but, you know, it just sort of, so it's a sort of coalescence, um, which, um, you know, just personally, I look at that in terms of the appearance of the universe anyway, that, that, that you, you at some point uh, out, out of the cosmic consciousness there was uh, just a little bit of a gathering of something and, and it just gradually turned out to be um, uh, um, the you know, manifestation of a, of, of a universe, I guess. Um, so there's, there's, there's something in, but that's possibly, is that, could, could you relate that to fractals where uh, there's a certain concentration of the pattern as it's unfolding, but in a certain point, there'll be a more, more baroque pattern yeah. forming, you know. Yeah, I guess. But, but, that's what but it's unpred it's unpredictable. So, so oh so yeah. You, so so that's the thing about it's it's um, not Turing complete. So you you have to you have to actually do the dialogue and go through the mm. algorithm to actually get to the new invention. You see, if you're linear thinking, Michael Shermer, you might think. Well, surely if it's all then determined in that kind of conversation, I could do a few leaps ahead. Is that, yeah. no, nah, not really. Uh, Turing says that you have to really do the actual hard work and nitty gritty. You, you'll be caught out at some stage. There'll be some component that you need, either metal that isn't developed yet because it develops too much heat. You see, you see, right at the point where the jet engine was invented, it was it was very unreliable because the material science was just at the same point. So they needed alloys and stuff that could handle the new heat. The real reason why you couldn't just get rid of the engine because it may have got shit hot <laughs> in the, between the compressor and the, and the exhaust fan. So, so they needed special alloys. And so alloys had to be invented in, in concert with, with the, the jet engine. But it's amazing, isn't it, that all of this came, came just at the point where the propeller had reached as fast as you can go, it reached the physical limit of the propeller because after a while, the tips of the propeller start breaking the, sp the sound barrier and it, it doesn't actually generate any more thrust anymore. So, but isn't it amazing that you get to this point where the propeller and planes get to the absolute limit that you can actually drive a plane, the physical limit you can drive a plane with, with a screw. And then just at that point, the jet engine's coming on just as the material science is is getting to the same point where it's going to just about tolerate those temperatures. And All right. So, supposing we take that idea, do, do something interesting with that idea, which is now this extremity of human existence, where where we're we're at the limit of uh, uh, I don't know what shall I pick? You, you know, we're at the limit of, of what everything. We are we are at the limit of everything. Yeah, is 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 that how how would you look at the possibility of a kind of a um, quantum leap to a different a different uh, so, so you know is, something completely different comes out of it? Did you do? Would you look at that simply as a spiritual? So this is a spiritual? good place to end off. I'll try and land it from this point, and then yeah. let everybody go. Yeah. But so the this is a disaster. An unmitigated disaster. So there are a lot of people that looking at examples like I just gave you with the, the jet engine. Mm. Okay, I'll use Michael Shermer because he's a fucking perfect linear thinking, narrow-minded idiot. So the, let's use him as the go-to go guy for idiocy. So, my, <laughs> my, so Michael Shermer's then look at all of those pinkers and <laughs> Jordan Petersons and you know, Dickie Dawkins types. They look at all of this stuff, historians of, of technology, and then they say, well, we, we are about to come to this convergence of so many things. Mm. There'll be nanotech. 
there'll be artificial intelligence. We'll, we'll crack all these energy solutions. Everything is coming, and they call basically what you're calling uh, this this huge tipping point. Then they call mm. it the technological singularity. So yeah, that means yeah. where everything converges with so many things. You can take one thing from here, and it enables this, and it enables that, and so mm. no. It's the fucking last hurrah of this line of thinking. Mm, mm. Okay, so so okay, now I'm on my metal in a, in a short period to just explain why. And it unfortunately, I have to give you a fucking whole uh, lecture to explain why, but I'll try and do it briefly. Okay. I have to limber up for this one. What we're doing with Michael Shermer type science, right? What science, according to the scientific method and empiricism, is they're trying to get stuff that's repeatable. So, okay, so Madame Blavatsky and all of this other science, this far more like Jungian uh, connections, the things which Shermer would say are illegitimate connections, apophenia. So, so we're trying to get things that are not apophenia. We're trying to get things that are repeatable. So we work with numerical methods, and Michael Shermer would do an experiment with a bell curve. So, according to Michael Shermer, angels don't exist. I know for a fact they exist, because I was in the Starbucks the other morning, and in walked an angel, and she walked right past me, got a latte, and walked out again. I went the next day to see if she would enter that latte at 10 o'clock exactly the same time. She came through the door at exactly the same time. She walked to the counter, ordered a latte, and on the way out, she looked right at me and smiled. Just smitten. So I know they're fucking angels. Now, I went back on the third day, and she didn't arrive. So I went back on the fourth day, and she didn't arrive. I went back for another thousand days, and she never came back in at 10 o'clock. Didn't ever come back in that coffee shop at any other time. Never saw her again. Now, Michael Shermer would say, those are outliers. Those two samples that I had, they're not illegitimate. Every scientist today doing millions and millions of experiments is saying, there's a bell curve. Those are outliers. Chuck them out. So they're looking for the ordinary. Basically, the, according to Michael Shermer, women look like the average woman. Why? Because that's the only one that you can show repeatably and for and unfalsifiably. That if you do a sample in the coffee shop at 10 o'clock, what, what you'll see is the average looking woman. So according to Michael Shermer, angels don't exist. But here's the problem with that line of thinking. If you do kind of Popperian science and you say basically you it's it's if it's not a legitimate result, unless somebody else can repeat it. So Shermer would try and repeat my result. You'd get ten different, ten different uh, people, put them in different coffee, you know, Starbucks around the place at, at ten o'clock or different times, and try and see if you can repeat that result. Well, you can't because he would get the average experimenter, and that's the first thing that's going wrong. So basically, the the angel was only because of me. I either imagined her or she was only there because I only thought she was an angel because she smiled at me. But it was only me and her. It's a unique coupling. Now, Michael Sherman would say that's not legitimate. Well, my whole life is based on that one. <laughs> if you go to like City Slickers, actually Carl Jung too also said that. City Slickers, there's that cowboy guy. If you don't remember the scene where he said, yeah, he's, a, he's been in love. He saw this woman once. And then basically the guy says, well, fuck, that's it? You didn't go and talk to her? He said, no, it would only go downhill from there. Funny enough, Jung said the same thing. He said he'd been totally in love with this woman that he had met while hiking on a mountain path. He never spoke to her. He just passed her once. And he basically he'd never seen anybody so, so beautiful and so perfect in his life. Basically, that was the love of his life, a girl that he passed once on a mountain path. So, so you can see the impact of that girl. And now look at Michael Shermer's world. It's a gray world where that doesn't happen. It's thrown out those oddities. So 
so what we're doing is create so so by throwing out the outliers a you're missing something and that's that the, the our outliers the first thing you you say there's a different kind of science where you only study the outliers if you go like nah that's in the bell curve that's michael Shermer stuff stick it i'm going to do a madam blavatsky and i'm going to look at the outliers and just the outliers well there's a new kind of science right there but if you try and do this and i highly recommend you do what you'll find out is it's intimately related to the experimenter so it's intimately related to you what you can see as an outlier if there's a science of outliers it's intimately related to the questioner so that's the second thing that michael Shermer and the pals are not doing is they thinking that there is the subjective world that is not related to the experimenter the experimenter is standing aloof like god from the experiment and is not involved and anybody could be the observer no the observer is always connected to the experiment it cannot be otherwise just the mere fact that you set the experiment up, set the experiment up means that you imposed a certain kind of thinking the fact that you you looked at the results numerically means that you imposed a certain kind there's you cannot set the experiment away from the experiment so once you do that and you realize there's deep self reference in it if you have this science of the of the outliers of the exceptions you say well yeah but i mean what's the use of this obviously you want to go with the run of the mill and the basically the rational stuff is in the middle the certainties in the middle of the bell curve here's the amazing thing hold on to your hat now they are wrong <laughs> they are drastically drastically wrong so they think they in the majority they have the majority on their side they have the data on their side they have the evidence on their side they have the weight of the of certainty on their side they do not why you have to go back to the mathematicians you go back to 1930 you go back to to the turn of the century very important in maths 1900 and what Cantor said, Cantor said an amazing result. You remember you're talking about rationality in the in the last last Sunday, Gary. And I said basically there's no use for rationality. So ration, rationality is just a ratio. It just means you can you have two numbers and they they basically can be expressed as a fraction. Now, everybody thought, well, you know, the natural numbers and the rational numbers, everything is rational. You know, Klaus Schwab. Bill Gates, they're all trying to be rational, rational, rational. Let's be rational. Like, so rationalism is, is, is not legitimate. In to, in, in basically, it's you know insane. Shoot these people through the head as soon as you can round them up. And the reason is given by Gerd Cantor. So Cantor made an amazing result in mathematics and said, okay, let, first of all, do you understand what an irrational number is? So an irrational number is a number that you can't express in two ratios. So they're things like pi, Euler's number, E, the square root of two. It was the square root of two was discovered by Hippas, right? So Hippas, so this is an interesting, if you don't know this story, square root of two was discovered by Hippas, who was a follower of Pythagoras's cult. Now Pythagoras was famous for the Pythagorean theorem and basically finding, you know, the square on the hypotenuse. Hippus was, you know, one of his followers, and he said, well, what happens if you get a unit size? Then the hypotenuse is the square root of two. Try work out the square root of two. <laughs> it's like a little bit fucked <laughs> because it's an irrational number. So the, so the, according to the theory, they threw Hippus overboard the, at sea. Because they, basically all the Michael Shermers and Pinkers and that who like worshipping, you know, Pythagoras saying we're going to get to this perfect world that's represented by the kind of geometry we do and the, you know, amazing Pythagorean theorem. And Hippos came along and said, a uh, little wrinkle over here, uh, unit sides and you've got the square root of two. And they were, they were like incensed because he, he, Hippos had destroyed the perfect world. But Cantor did exactly the same thing. And many people do it continually because we're living in Pythagoras's fucking wet dream. But the amazing result that Cantor said was Cantor looked and said, okay, are there more 
rational numbers or irrational numbers? Well, the rational numbers, like say the natural numbers, are like one, two, three, four. Right? There are an infinity of them. Well, now most people think infinity is infinity. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Cantor did a lot of maths with infinities. He was the first one to say, "No, let's let's really look at infinity and not be scared of it." Mathematicians were petrified of it. Physicists are petrified of it. They, all our climate models are all wrong because physicists and climatologists. They run the models, they run to infinity, and they go like, oh, okay, that's a pathological case, and they throw it out. Well, no, that is the case. We, we are on, you know, RPC fucked because yeah. basically we are on one of those trajectories that run to infinity, when the ones they throw out. That's why the IPCC is full of shit. But anyway, going back to Cantor, Cantor then asked, Ian Michael Shermer and those guys, are they saying, are they legit? You're just throwing out the outliers. You're saying, you know, all the angels that I saw in Starbucks. You say, well, that's ah, uh, that's a chance in a million. Well, okay, let's take the chance in a million for a start. There's a guy who, who looked at the maths of, of long odds <laughs> and said, basically, if you take something like a chance in a million, you say, well, he found that you have about a chance in a million events Every, about every 30 days. About everybody has about a chance in a million events about every 30 days. Yeah, here I'm thinking back to what you said about your experience with the software. And, yeah. And, you know, we, we, we said, well, this is going to happen every 12 seconds. Yeah, the that's what we Mick know, did. That, that, yeah, that's yeah, but exactly the, it. Yeah, Mick, the, Mick, the, Mick was the saying thing, the thing, that, yes. that what you think is an outlier, the outliers yeah. are the norm. So let's, let's no, just... Well, that's, so, so, so let's just take this as a rubric for this whole thing is saying the outliers are the norm. Now think what, what we're trying to do, what the industrial for, uh, you know, industrial revolution 4.0 is trying to do. It's, it's trying to normalize everything. It's trying to basically put everything in a straitjacket to find where it is on the bell curve, eliminate all the long tails. And yeah, so but there's something so else. There's, there's something else behind it. it is that if you look at our project, if you look at, I don't know what you want to call it, but in the case of your friend who was saying this was going, he did his calculations that this is going to occur every Nick, 12 seconds. Yeah. He knew he knew how fast he knew the abilities of the computers. Now no, we're in a no, situation. The, the, where, the, the key to Mick was he it, didn't go to university. You see, they fill yeah, everybody's heads with rocks in university, and he he the, didn't. The point no, but the point the point I'm trying to make is we're here saying that the well the Shermers, as you're saying, are pointing out that this these outliers are just to be disregarded, outlying events. But yeah, he doesn't like know how. No, but they, he doesn't know how fast the computer that's the so-called computer yes, is running. Yes. You see, yeah, but but, but wait, that's wait, what, for it. but but wait for it. It's much worse than than you think. You've got it, but it's much worse than that. So, 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 what Cantor showed was was so. You see, what these guys are saying is these are outliers. Okay, you just trim off those. That's onesies, twosies. You know, it's an asparagus field up on the side. We'll take the big hump in the middle. That's the normal thing, and we stick with that. We're on solid ground. You're not. That's what taught in universities all over the fucking world. You're mad, 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 mad. And Cantor showed why, because. What's in the middle of the bell curve is the rational stuff. So the rational numbers are basically countably infinite. I can get every rational number, and I can get the natural numbers, and I can pair them up. And Cantor said they are countably infinite. Here's the weird fucking thing. And it's especially weird for mathematicians. <laughs> Because we only know of a handful of irrational numbers. We know like pi and e and phi, you know, the Fibonacci number. We, we only know like a dozen irrational numbers. So Cantor's result is absolutely stunning because he said, and this, you can't get more hyperbolic than this. You cannot possibly be too hyperbolic on this. Is that Cantor said that actually when you look at it, the, and he had a proof that that the irrational numbers are uncountably infinite. So the rational numbers are countably infinite. The irrational numbers are uncountably infinite. So there are so many more 
irrational numbers than rational numbers that there are it, it basically it, you have to imagine an infinity that dwarfs a countable infinity. So if you imagine yeah, but he's, has he got a range so, of such a thin line on this line of uncountable. So that but this is an extraordinary result. It's saying that not only are the Shermers wrong, but the exceptions are the rule. It's all exceptions. It's everything, Mick. It's much more, much worse than Mick was saying. It's basically what we're doing in science is taking not a sliver, we're taking as an infinite sliver of, of essentially an uncountably infinite number line. That's how fucked we are. Does, does yeah. anybody get this? How bad this is. Oh, look, when you yeah. first put up that thing about Cantor, and that it's, it, it, you know, I think you wrote something, or there was, some, you know, it, it, when you first come across the term uncountably infinite, you assume somebody's made a typographical mm -hmm. error. You have to go away for a few days and think about it, you know. Um, but um, be careful on that one. Cantor, Cantor, like I said, wound up in a mental institution. Well, yeah, you know, but I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm. Yeah. I want to play devil's advocate here and just say that Cantor escaped the problem by inventing two different kinds of infinity. You know, the, the, the one that was count, countable and one that was uncountable. And therefore, you could sort of... Um, no, worse, worse than that. He, he said that there are actually an infin, infinity of infinities. So, so the countable numbers are Aleph zero. But basically, he proved that the, you, you can actually square an Aleph. So you could have... Uh, infinite infinity to the power of infinity and you can have that uh, basically to an infinite uh, you know infinite progressive in, of powers so you could have an yeah, infinite power of infinity and so the, so that's just makes a nonsense out of mathematics so they they, th they thought that that kind of thing was a they said was a kind of pathology that they th hoped mathematics would recover from it it hasn't to this day but they, they've just ignored it and carried on. And that, that's pretty much how our whole society works and this mad errand that we're on. That, so, so I hope I made this clear, that the technological singularity is based on normalcy, right? It's, it's not going to turn out to this fabulous utopia. It's called that rapture of the nerds is the end of the story. What, it disapp what happens on the other side of the rap rapture of the nerds is extreme entropy. So, so there will be no order. So, so in other words, they, they in, in pursuing rationality, when they get to the rapture of the nerds, the other side of the rapture of the nerds will, will be no order. In other words, just complete randomness. So that's an extraordinary result, by the way, because it means that you achieved utter randomness out of a random i mean a, a, a deterministic process yeah yeah, yeah. so, so our civilization is about to achieve yeah. complete entropy out of the pursuit of complete a complete order the street yeah. order yeah. and a clock yeah so i know you posted a video on the documentary on Go girdle and Cantor, I'll, I'll post it again. I think that's something worth yeah, yeah, this, watching this one, just to BBC understand. One, which, which, yeah, yeah, and this uh, is where these things where I where think the, I'll catch the guy did a very good job. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's called dangerous knowledge. So, yeah, so that, yeah. that's that you see, that guy he 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 realized, I don't think he really understood what those guys, you know, Boltzmann, um, mm -hmm. Cantor, Gödel. Uh, I don't even yeah. mention Turing much, but but the you yeah. see, he the guy who made it he ca he came close to getting getting it, uh, and what I mean by getting it was was getting understanding what those guys saw, and <laughs> and why it, it's it's kind of a bit sophomoric to say that it drove them mad, but it's also not you see all of those guys Boltzmann committed suicide, Cantor was committed to a lunatic asylum. Um, so so uh, Gödel, Gödel, his wife, committed him to an institution against his will, and he died. In there. And so it's a, basically all of those guys, they ended up badly. I mean, Pythagoras ended up badly. But, but the reason why is you've got to take someone like Boltzmann is it, 
he utterly despaired. So, so what Boltzmann believed in the atom at a time when very few other people did, um, and uh, at just at the end of the last century, and he really invented the statistics that later would be applied to statistical mechanics, uh, basically, and led to quantum theory because you know, it was all statistics. So statistics is doing what I'm characterized as Michael Shermer, just taking the middle of the bell curve. So basically, you, the st statistical simplification is is really a digital simplification, and so that's that's fatal because in in taking an average or doing any kind of statistical average or normalization, you've lost the detail that matters, and so if you get the the whole thing that the anomalies are the majority, then then you've hauled out a minority situation. And you've assumed that it's the rule. So the anomalies are the rule, not, not the normal thing. So what we're doing in science that's repeatable is actually the anomaly. You, you see that over and over again, and they don't see it. They, they think they're capturing the minority, the majority thing. So you, it, or it goes all the way, and we're about to do it again. I mean, Blair did this in all the metrics and stuff in, in the UK. So basically, we'll we'll have managed outcomes, we'll have evidence based, and we'll all run it by the numbers. And that was the fucking neoliberal fucking thing, and we and and it didn't work. And there, it didn't it didn't work in the Soviet Union, and the, the reason is everybody fudged to get the results. So to get the average results, you. You just say, okay, well, these are the metrics that a doctor is, basically how many patients recovered and stuff. And that's simplifying out how many ways a doctor can fool the system to get that number. So, so this is, you're taking a very complex system. There are an in, infinite number of ways, Gödel style, I mean, Cantor style, to get a number that these fucking idiots think is inviolate, like, you know, a... a um, an impact token or something like that from these, like Alison McDowell is talking about. So, so they'll get one metric. So these, if you let these tyrants get in charge, they'll have one metric, like you know how how much recidivism in a in a criminal did you avoid with your program or your your electrode stuck in somebody's brain, you know, electronic vaccine. If you see that post, man, that's scary shit. And they say, like, okay, we will reward the company that makes the electrodes and the people that provide the service to stimulate, you know, ex-cons. Um, and say, you know, if they if they get violent, they'll have to their cell phone or maybe an implant will will say, okay, this guy's getting violent. We we tell from these parameters that basically he has elevated uh, adrenaline, he's shouting and stuff, and then basically they'll stimulate his brain to calm down. And then basically we'll say, okay, well, we based on the statistics, you average that out. We stopped in some number of murders and number of assaults. Each one of those assaults costs this much. Each one of the lives cost in a murder is basically given. Basically, everybody liberals think that there's no such thing. Or well, every life is infinitely valuable. No, it isn't. It's very quantifiable, and they will do it in a court if you wind up in a in a tort case in a court for like something like manslaughter, they will actually price what the person's life worth. <laughs> that's that's what will be written in in basically the adjudication. So so yeah. So but in doing all this, they, they're missing uh, how many ways say this guy could you know work around the system to get to give. A false result of that, you know. Uh, there, there's so many, there are an infinite number of ways that you can get to the simple metrics, and so, so the their simple metrics are based on a very linear thinking, which puts them at to, at the top. But but the world is working from Maupertuis' least action, and and that and as I said, their action is not the least action. So if you go to the back to the executives that I had to work for that wanted Six Sigma and perfect bug free free software, right? The actual world works with bugs. So the bugs are necessary. They kind of help the world evolve and basically they help the world be more fluid. Now that 
if you say that the world's not allowed to be fluid, it's got to be rigid and directed and measurable and evidence-based. That's not the path of least action. So all the guys are subject to that regime. They will take the path of least action. And the path of least action is to how to freak that figure. That's what happened. Like McNamara tried this in, in Vietnam. Basically, he tried to do manage the war in Vietnam by the numbers. America was fucked, kicked in the nuts. And the reason was the, the basic metric that McNamara found that worked best on his spreadsheets was body count. Well, the, eventually it got so fucking retarded. I mean, body count is easy to fake. You basically, all the, all the career guys who are trying to get promoted found ways to get their body count up without actually getting bodies. But it got so bad in Vietnam that eventually the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, they they figured out, how, you know, that, that that's what the Americans were doing. And they would get bodies uh, like at, at uh, Gen Bien Phu. They got bodies and they reused them. They would do like an attack and they would, you know, leave all the bodies out there. They would go in the night, fetch them all back. And the next wave in the morning, they would come and they'd leave all the bodies. They'd use the bodies five or six times till they were like decaying on them. Because they knew the Americans were basically saying, well, we're winning in Dien Bien Phu. But what the, the Viet Cong was, uh, was, was taking very light casualties. So to this day, the Americans say that, oh, you know, it was a huge battle and stuff. No, Americans were forced, forced to a standstill. And now they realize the Viet Cong took very small, small, uh, small losses and didn't improve. It was actually a Viet Cong win. But they, they fooled the Americans into thinking it was their win by just manipulating the body count. You see, that, that's what life will do. It, it will always find the shortest route to your metric. And it's not going to be the one you want, because the one you want is basically based on a false premise. And yeah, that's so the best I can do on this <laughs> on this long, long thing. Tying it back to the ARG, it seems like is is this ARG's project really showing that anomalies, outliers, unpredictability is a part of life, that things that we were taught in school, in jobs about predictability and normalcy and average is completely upside down. I mean, yeah. That's what I'm uh, getting. The, the, the aim is to create discord. So there's, there's a famous statue of the devil and uh, all these Satanists uh, worship it. I think they put it up in, in Minneapolis or somewhere like that. It's, I can't remember where they put it. But anyway, with some, some city in America, they caused outrage by, you know, putting this satanic um, statue up in front of the uh, constitutional Christian one. And they, they, they wanted to put it opposite. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they've been allowed to do it. But, but anyway, the reason I bring it up is, you see there's a tattoo written on, on the Satan's left and right arm. And, and one is, is Solve and one is Aguile or something like that. But anyway, what it is, is, is the devil is supposed to, and the devil is us, <laughs> by the way, uh, is, is supposed to, um, well, we play the role of the devil because it's the trickster and the, the shamanic role. It's the, the guys that actually do creative, creative order and, uh, and life and you know, fight against the rigidity and regimentation. So, so anyway, what, the, so what the, the devil is credited with is, is the power of coagulation and, and um, dissolution. And so in, in any psyops, the basically uh, the psyopsis always has two parts, and the, the psyops is to to basically get discord in the narrative of the enemy, and to get concord and uh, coherence in the narrative of um, of of basically your side. So so the idea is to is to spin chaos for the benefit of. Of, of everybody involved, if they if they carry on on their program of of re regimentation, it would be a disaster for them and us. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, it, it drives them nuts because they they like, you know, how can people possibly not be with this program? And you'll never talk them out of it because they they're crazy.
yeah but life will find a way yes yeah, just like jurassic park life will find a way. so we are on the side of life and they're on the side of death that predictably they're looking for is stale it's crystalline it's brittle um it's a lie at, at the heart of the christian god yahweh the whole idea behind this kind of control is is a lie and it's it's a it's a denial of death so basically part part of being on team human and being on the side of life is accepting that the, if you are on the side of life there is no death you, you don't i don't believe that wildebeest brought down by a lion on the serengeti are actually dying if you look at what happens to their constituents they just become part of lions and carry on <laughs> See, what what will happen is if we manage the Serengeti, the lions and the buffalo will disappear. There won't be any life left. So anyway, on that note, should we end off? <laughs> should, we, should we do the exercise and just go out on the exercise? I think everybody's falling asleep by this time. Yeah. So, so get, Gary, should we end it there? Sorry. Um yeah, it's been a very long session here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, mean, I, I yeah. felt I had to get cover this ground all in one go because it's so damned important. Um, but maybe it's a it's a stretch. But anyway, I I at least it's all in one video, and maybe it can reference it when you try and explain something. <laughs> That's a true point. But anyway, the, how, how close did I get to answering the first one percent of your questions, Gary? Yeah, no. Um, uh, well, I haven't got it. Uh, sorry, I, I think that's that's pretty good, actually. Um, um, uh, yeah, my my. Uh, I suppose what do you want to do next week is deal with the arg side of it. How how that? Any anything you want, whatever pops up, whatever anybody wants to do. The the arg will take its um, its pace, right? Right. Yeah. So um, again, we mustn't fall foul of our of our own mojo, right? So it's it's got to be organic. If 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 it's not working and it's not the right time, then then our whole project will dissolve, and we we should accept that. So it's like, yeah, we don't we we don't um, want to become our own enemy. <laughs> So you don't want to try and force the whole thing, but you see, I, I hope you yeah. realize what, that you, we put a little tendrils out and more, you know, more people thinking this way, and then that's that's how it grows. You know, there, eventually there will be a time. I mean, at the rate it's going, it's way too slow to save the planet. <laughs> On, on the names on the faces a r g r -G in the middle i was looking at that oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's the normally i'm talking about okay maybe that people talk about next time we talk about apophenia and and legitimate and illegitimate ones but oh okay but there we get to the cities okay but there, there was something in in that uh, wh where was it? On one of the the things with with Jeff Hall, maybe the Latitude Society, and one of you see all these guys, they find a little bit of Sorcerer's Apprentice. If you start doing an ARG, you will find all of this weird. <laughs> I'm, I've warned you a couple of times now, but yeah. You will find thanks the for the and thanks for the signal, the signal podcast. Yeah. But, it's but, extremely pleasant to listen to. Yeah, we, but we must try weave in and stuff and try and uh, augment it and stuff. But you see, the thing that was, where I was going was that the, the guy found that just by chance, um, you know, there was a little arrow in, in one of the things that pointed to a wall. It was just a thing. It was like, oh, yeah. You, you know, they had to quickly intervene in the arg. To stop people like breaking through the wall because that arrow was not intended it was just perfect <laughs> just, just, uh, just by chance and i say oh, ha, ha, you think it was just by chance grasshopper but you wait oh, somebody had broken yeah. through that wall and you'd found a body in it or something oh ha, ha, that would have gaslit a lot of people 
<laughs> so you watch out this you know, wild ride wild ride man <laughs> but i keep on i keep on saying this not to not to freak you out but to say like it, it's good just just you, you you gotta you gotta you gotta get in a frame of mind where you don't get gaslit easily so that when you get yeah. gaslit, you don't run for the hills it's not a tough to yeah. Now, imagine, imagine you get into those one of those situations. You get gasless, and then you run. Right? Not a good place to be. Because where are you going to run to? You're going to you're going to run to a psychologist or go to get psychotherapy and say I got involved in this game, and like I'm completely freaked out. And they say, Oh, yep, apophenia, schizophrenia. <laughs> you're going to be in a far worse position. So it's, like well, it's the same as people who are having religious experiences, except yeah. they don't run to the psychiatrist, they run to the priest. But yeah. You can just yeah. say yeah. they belong to this cult. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Desiderata extinctionity. So that's yeah. why it gives you a <laughs> if, license. If, <laughs> what, what I'm saying is if you get gaslit, lean into it. Yeah. Don't, run for, don't run for the priest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like... It, it, you got to treat it like some kind of like Native American initiation where you draw a circle and all the creepy, weird phantoms come out of the forest and you, you've got to hold your ground. You've got to stare down all the phantoms. Yeah, yeah. Have right. fun with the phantoms, right? Exactly. Have, have the fun, fun is fun. fun. Yeah. Right. And, and you also, you've already mentioned the exercises, right? Um, 1880, med the meditation, emergency aid so i, I yeah. that's i feel like that's yeah. very helpful please yeah. go back to those yeah very good yeah. If, if, if that's very well well put my uh, if, yeah. if you wind up in those situations where you're gaslit immediately you know fall still and well, well let's do it let's do oh, this is <laughs> so basically let's let's go go out this so, okay so balanced and erect you could be standing doesn't matter. You could be behind the wheel of a car or plane or boat. Doesn't matter. It would, it's not essential that you're sitting, but you just center yourself. Let the muscular tension fall away from your shoulders, your neck, your face, your thighs. Get in touch with all five senses. Go to the listening. Don't be captivated by any sound. Just try and connect with the deep silence. It's kind of the backdrop to all the sounds you can hear. Om Paramatma Nenama Iti. Well, thank you, everyone. That was very long, but I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm no good at this, and I can't distill what, what I'm trying to say into any less. <laughs> I'll get better at it, and you, you can have a shorter time. Well, no, it was really good. Yeah, yeah, it was thank unexpected, you. actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, Try thanks for that. Thank you. Post some yeah. references, a lot of good references from today's yeah. Uh, yeah. meeting. <laughs> oh, I hope so. Yeah. Well, have fun during the week. And all right. Thanks. The, Thanks. The, the ripeness is all. If you're not having good theater, what's the point? <laughs> all right, everybody. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you next bye. Time. bye. Bye, everyone. Okay.